This is Hunter Wade at the Athletes Lounge Podcast. I'm here with my guest. David Magley. So uh, let's just get right into it. Let's let's talk about the the basketball league. Let's talk about it. The uh the uh or well what here, what's what is your role within the basketball league? There we go. I'm the president of the basketball league. I I, I own it with my wife. She's the CEO. Evelyn Magley, she's the founder and visionary, and I'm, as I am in right now in the car, just driving Miss Daisy around and making this thing work. The uh, and so I guess, can you explain a little bit what the uh, basketball league is for the people I don't know? So the basketball league is a professional basketball league that is uh, the third highest in North America. You've got the NBA, you've got the G League, and then us. We would be like Double A baseball or. If you're in another country, it would be like Pro B in Europe, um, where we tend to be in in, in, in medium-sized to small markets, uh, where our guys can become community assets and really impact the lives of the community. So we we pride ourselves in having family fun, affordable entertainment, and that's exactly what it is. And, you know, you're from Evansville, so uh, the Indiana markets we have are very good. And Kokomo does great with uh, you know we played a 6,000 seat high school gym uh with jumbotrons and and um <clears throat> we'll average near 2,000 fans and then Lebanon is about the same with a little smaller gym and then we have a team in, in Medora Indiana which you have to be from south central Indiana to have a clue where that can be um town of 500 people no stoplights no grocery stores no gas stations no restaurants, just a bar that serves fried food. Yet with that town of 500, they got a gym that seats 1,200. And typical Indiana, they sell out every game. So it's it's been it's been an impact to every community we get we go to. And the how many teams are in the league currently? Uh, TBL will have 50 teams, and then we have a second league called the Basketball Super League, which is a little higher level, mostly in Canada, and they'll have seven or eight teams as well. So our our family of businesses will have about 58 teams in it this year. Speaking of Canada, you spent quite a bit of time up in Canada, didn't you? Yes, I went up to Canada to, uh, to help start a prep school uh, called Orangeville Prep Athlete Institute with Jamal Murray and, and Thon Maker, some great players there. I, I don't get much credit for that because that's a lot of people were involved in pulling that off. And then I helped start a pro basketball team in the NBL Canada called the Brampton A's uh, with, with, a, with a guy that was the owner of the team named uh, James Tipping. And the Tipping family was who I worked with, and they were really wonderful for the basketball landscape in Canada. I'm happy you mentioned Jamal Murray. I'm a Nuggets fan, so that's uh, a <laughs> – that's, uh... he's, he's a, And he's a, he's a great kid. Have you ever seen the, uh, the TV show Shits Creek? Yes, sir. Th- that's where those kids lived. Okay. <laughs> Literally in that motel where they film it. Okay, that that, our that's motel. cool. So there's been posted Jamal Murray used to live in the Shits Creek Motel, and that was when he was at our prep school. Now they have a wonderful four or five story um, dormitory right on their campus. It's beautiful, but they've they did what they had to do, and it's and it's you know the Shits Creek Motel has made them look a little worse than it was. It's actually a beautiful place, right on a a, a great. Uh, creek river that, that flew, uh, flowed behind it it's a pretty neat place so you're you went to kansas for your college basketball mm-hmm. uh, experience so I, I guess how was that who'd you play under when you're there his name is ted owens okay he was there for 19 years went to a couple final fours and i think our best year we lost in the sweet 16 to a really good wichita state team with Antoine Carr and cliff livingston um but you know I mean, being from Indiana, getting to play at a school like Kansas, one of the great schools in, 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 in college basketball, was wonderful. Um, as a freshman, I got to play against Magic Johnson when he was at Michigan State. And Michael Jordan's first game as a freshman in college was against us uh, when I was a senior. Um, I was uh, probably had the greatest career in the history of Kansas basketball, better than Wiltz, better than Danny <laughs> Manning, better than JoJo White. Because unlike those guys who are great players in their own right, Paul Pierce, they were stars from the moment they got on campus. I came in as Indiana High School Mr. Basketball with a big reputation 
and had a very disappointing start to my career. Uh, my coach called when he was writing his, his, his book and he said, Dave, I didn't realize, but you were one for 25 when you first got to KU. That's one make out of 25 attempts. And I kind of pushed back a little bit. And I said, coach, I don't think I was one for 25. I was, 0 for 1, 0 for 2, 1 for 3, 0 for 1, 0 for 2. You know, it was an aggregate of my first 12 or 13 games was probably 1 for 25. And that meant I wasn't playing very well. And and he made me get better and, and earn every minute I got. And I got an opportunity against Oklahoma State and to start the second half and had the first 10 points of the second half. And from there, I became the sixth man. And the next year, I started every game and started every game as a junior and senior. And by the end of my career, was one of the leading scorers and rebounders in the conference. And all of that happens because I got to grow every year, you know, four points a game as a freshman and six or eight as a sophomore and 10 as a junior and 21 and 12 as a senior. And that adds up to a really cool experience. So while I'm clearly not the best player, didn't have the most fabulous career as far as the stats go, I think I had the best career because I got to learn and grow while I was at Kansas. Well, you improved enough where the Cavs, you know, took a shot on you in the second round. Yeah, that was just, just high enough that I could get the coach draft, uh, fired for probably drafting me too high. So I don't <laughs> know. that was a good move for him. Yeah. But it was, you know, being from Indiana, it's, again, I got a chance to play in the NBA and play against Larry and Magic and 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 and, and, and um, uh, Kareem and Dr. J, guys I looked up to my whole life. So that was pretty a, a pretty cool experience. And then, Got to play in the CBA for Phil Jackson before he went to the Bulls and the Lakers and then got to play in a few countries in Europe. So, you know, again, I got to live my my basketball dreams out pretty good. So you mentioned Cliff Livingston a little while ago. He was a coach in the basketball league, right? Or is he still? You no, know, he is. He, he coaches the Kokomo team. Yeah. The, uh, uh, I was going to say at Kansas, the, uh, what other, did you have any other, I'm sure you did have Kansas offered you. I'm sure you had other offers sitting there, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I had uh, probably 400 letters oh, uh, yeah. offers from around the country. I mean, I was, uh, the, the, you know, when you're in the high school, Mr. Yeah. Basketball, um, you know, Purdue, my, my IU visit with Coach Knight didn't go real well. But, but you know, the whole, the whole experience was unique for me because my mother was sick when I was a senior in high school. Well, actually, she was sick my whole high school career. And and was probably going to die when I was a senior. And, and so that was, um, that cut curtailed a lot of my recruiting. I wouldn't let coaches come in after a certain time at night to see me because after practice, I needed to get downtown to see my mom and husband. So and we only had one car, so I'd have to hitchhike downtown to see her and then hitchhike home, do my homework, get up in the morning and get to school and do what you do. And so it was, it was different. And I only took, I only took two official visits, one to Kansas and one to Michigan. Um, took an unofficial visit to Purdue, really because I was interested in watching Notre Dame play Purdue in football. And the game I went to, uh, ironically, until they had a they had a, a third string quarterback came off the bench in the third quarter to lead Notre Dame back from twenty eight down to win it, and he would go on to be Joe Montana. <laughs> and I got to see him get his first his first chance to play. And he was incredible. So, you know, that was that was kind of a neat opportunity for me. The so you'd say was, was Michigan probably that ended up, I guess, second in your. Absolutely, it was. And it was a tough call because Coach Orr was at Michigan. He would later go to Iowa State, but he was a great guy, great coach, great staff, beautiful campus, great facility. Um, but but Kansas kind of cheated. They they introduced me to the lady that would be my wife and. When I met her on my recruiting trip, it was over. Once I met her, I'm like, I'm going to Kansas because I can't do better than this. She's the prettiest girl I'd ever seen in my life and the most pure, sweet person. And like I said, I met her on my recruiting trip and knew I'd marry her the day I met her. And we've been married 43 years, so it's kind of a cheat for Kansas. They got me the the the, the best way possible by having me fall in love with someone. So you, you're from South Bend originally, right? Yep. So what was the transition like? Uh, going from South Bend over to Kansas. Uh, Grant, the colleges are pretty good about acclimating their kids to the new environments, but it was hard. I mean, I had I had real high expectations. You know, when you're Mr. Basketball, you think you're pretty special, and um, 
the, the difference was, you know, at, at Kansas, you know, systems make players. I yeah. mean, not and, and when I got to play at Kansas, uh, our coach was coming off a three guard system, so he really didn't play a small forward. And and I was six eight, you know, two hundred and well, probably two hundred two most of my career, about ninety five to two hundred two. So I was really slender, really wasn't a power forward. I could handle the ball like a guard, and that was my position was to play three. And 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 um, you know, I probably wasn't athletic enough when I got there. I probably wasn't fast enough to play. I mean, our guards were six five, six six, but they were really good and they were really fast. And and um, you know, I got my break when coach came to me and said, Hey, would you, would you be willing to move to power forward? I'm like, man, come, give me any number you want. Just put me on the court. And it, it made my game better. I became a better rebounder. I became a better defender on the post. And, and, you know, the next year I became the small forward that would back up the power forward. some. and then by the time I was a senior, I played one through five. I mean, I'd play all, all five positions. And that's, that's the thing that young people don't understand today is, Everybody comes in and they tell you what number they are. I'm a one, I'm a two, I'm a three. Like, just be a player. Just be a basketball player and let the coach decide where they need you because you got to get playing time. That's all that should matter to you is getting on the court. And if you understand that, you'll grow and you'll you'll become what you need to be. The And I was going to say, you were in the what was pretty much the original Big Eight, weren't you? Yes. The, uh, so what was that? Kind of, I'm struggling to remember. Uh, why wasn't that I alive was, then? So, that was Kansas, Missouri, Kansas State, Iowa State, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, and Colorado. So I guess who are some of the people within the conference at the time that you, I guess you played against? Um, there was a guy named Steve Stepanovich. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was Missouri. Big draft behind um, Ralph Sampson by the Pacers. Uh, he played with a kid named uh, John Sunbold that was a really mm -hmm. good player. Got drafted by Miami. Uh, Ricky Frazier got drafted by the Bulls. All of those guys were Mizzou guys. Eddie Neely and Rolando Blackman both came from K State. They were they were very very good. Um, uh, the the uh, um, Jay Humphreys was a good guard that came from Colorado. I played with Darno Valentine and and Paul Mokeski and yeah. Uh, my senior year, Carl Henry was a redshirt. His his son. Uh, 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 Xavier Henry, Xavier Henry also played at KU and played in the NBA. Uh, so yeah, we played a lot, of, got, got a lot of good players in the conference. Did you did you ever rap with Scott Wedman in Colorado? So so Scott Wedman and I played together for the Cavaliers. Yeah, and he's you know, he's one of my best friends. I love Scott. Okay, yeah, I like. Uh, he was a, I guess what is now the King. He was a was he a Royal at one point on Cincinnati he, or Can Kansas City? I guess. But when. When the Cincinnati Royals moved to Kansas City, they became the the um, the uh, uh, Kansas City Omaha yeah. Royals. And then after about three years, they stopped going to Omaha and they became the Kansas City Kings. And uh, and Scotty, he might still be one of their all-time leading scorers. He was he was great for them. He was I mean six seven can really shoot, really strong. He's tough. He was really good. Yeah, he had a. Him and Otis Bird song had a year where I think they're the eighth seed and they were like two games away from the finals. Yeah, but they Phoenix. It was a great, it was a great series. They had Phil Ford, Sam Lacey, uh, Bill Robenzine, um, uh, Josie Merriweather, Larry Drew. Uh, that was a whale of a team. Yeah, some of those teams get lost when teams relocate to new cities. Some of those old teams in the old cities kind of get lost in the. No, they do. The people don't realize that you know Oscar Robertson was part of that fame program. Yeah. People don't realize that that program actually came from Rochester. Yeah, it's the Rochester Royals originally. Yeah, yeah. The the, the fantastic thing about that was that the somehow I don't really know the story correctly, but Rochester had the number one draft pick. Yeah, and they just built a new arena. Uh, uh, it, now it's called the Blue Cross Blue Shield Arena, and um, they wanted to get the ice capades. Yeah, and rights the other uh, the ice capades were owned by the by the by the boston garden and the celtics traded uh for bill russell for the rights to bill russell the the rights to the ice capades so the royals who would who would i don't know if they won the championship but they either won the championship or got into the finals one of those years and they went from there to a, just a disastrous team when they got when they didn't take advantage of that pick and they ended up moving to cincinnati from there but 
the, that's it was, it was interesting because they traded uh, Bill Russell was part of a trade for the Ice Capades, which was an interesting move. Yeah, well, I guess basketball wasn't quite the money draw it is now because now uh, I, no, I guess is the reasoning. Listen, the, the 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 truth of the matter is basketball didn't become a money draw until the TV came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. specifically cable television. That's how sports that's, make money. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's it's um when I was in the NBA, our player uh, representative, a guy named Larry Fleischer, who was the head of the Players Association, uh, the 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 attorney. He, I remember he came to us at an exhibition game in West Virginia and said, "Listen." we might go on strike uh, if they don't give us a piece of the profits. And we're like, no one makes money. What do you mean a piece of the profits? They said, no, 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 you don't understand. This thing, cable television, this ESPN that was only in its second or third year, it's going to change the world because think about it. Um, football only has so many games. Uh, it's outdoors. They're covered up. It's a good cable TV, but it's a prime TV game. Baseball's in the summertime. It's a long game. It's hard to watch uh, on TV. It's hard to translate. Um, the hockey is a very fast game that you can't see the puck on TV, so it's really uh, television. But pro basketball player, 10 guys virtually naked running up and down the court in front of people. You can watch every game. We've got so much content that we're going to end up – it's going to be a big – man, he was right. And today – when you think about it, if you take the 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 uh, the television rights out of the NBA, that every team would lose money. Yeah, the G League couldn't exist because they lose money, except for they're funded by the NBA teams because of the TV rights. The WNBA couldn't exist because they lose money, and they're funded from the NBA because of the TV rights. So that one move has changed the landscape of pro and now. It could be argued the pro basketball, the basketball specifically, is the fastest growing sport in the world. And yeah. a lot of that's of, of cable television. And a lot of that's some of the money that the NBA was able to put in other uh, other places because they had so much money from the, the TV. Yeah, they, they don't, they, uh, David Stern and Adam Silver have made very few mistakes. They're really sharp guys that, you know, it's like they've got the BAL in, in Africa now. Well, that's not a moneymaker for them, but it's a pipeline of players and yeah. it's a way to respect that community they they take their teams to china they take their teams to europe but you know they're really they built their brand in, a, in an awesome way i was gonna say the i don't know if it's related to the african uh you know the up you know the the more focused in the african area but the uh south sudan just made their first olympics so yeah and what, what's interesting you know because of my time in canada you know i People don't realize that there's more Canadians in the NBA than any country besides the U.S. Yeah, there's a lot of them. There's there's nineteen twenty every year, and and, and you got, got you mentioned Murray, got one jersey right got, here. Got Dylan Brooks. That? Got Dylan there, Brooks jersey. <laughs> Dylan Brooks from, from Brampton, Ontario. You know, you've got uh, Tristan Thompson and yep. you, Andrew Wiggins. You've got uh, Kelly Olynyk. R.J. The, Barrett. R.J. Barrett. The the. The kid from uh, Oklahoma City that's really gotten good, that's Shea Gilkes. Uh, okay. Lou Dort from Canada, too. Lou Dort's from Canada. I mean, they're, they're all, there's just a lot of really talented kids. Yeah, and, the, uh, and I wonder how much of that is uh, Vince Carter down the line influence. <laughs> the, uh... that's, a big, that's a big piece. I think it's a very um, – so they have a very liberal immigration policy. Yeah. So they get a lot of Africans, they get a lot of – uh, Islanders, Jamaicans specifically. Most of those young men are Jamaican. Yeah. Um, and they, you know, the Jamaicans come in as track athletes and soccer athletes. And they so they're very athletic to begin with because of the sports that they've grown up playing. And then basketball is the is the most popular uh, uh, sport to play in Canada. It's bigger than hockey because you can't afford hockey. Yeah. People love the, 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 the so participation is basketball. Viewing is still hockey. Heck, second viewing in in in, in Canada is is uh, curling. Now you want to talk about a cultural thing? That's different. But as far as playing, people want to play basketball. They're they're actually behind in gyms and parks and all that because they built like they'll build out a community center and it will have a figure skating rink for twelve people to skate a, a day, and they'll have thousands of kids that want to play basketball and not build a gym because they don't uh, really. 
the, the community leaders don't fully haven't caught up with what the, the people love. And you're right, it's Canada's team. Uh, Vince Carter was, you know, Vince Sanity made it really popular. But man, when they won that championship with the claw, that whole country, everywhere you went outdoors, there were jumbotrons in every major city, every every small city watching those final games. So they right. that's the one that's the one country that has one team and they're they're definitely they say the Cowboys are America's team and they're nothing like the Raptors to Canada. The uh the uh ironically there's no Canadian on that team that won a championship, which is uh ironic, I guess, considering how many are in the league <laughs> that no, but they, they had done a um they'd done an amazing job with their G League development. Yeah, you they know, have. Yakum was a G League kid and, and the um the kid from Wichita State that the, the, the shorter one Fred Van Fleet. He he was a he was a, a, a you know, because they what people don't realize is that they'd won the G League championship a, a year or two before that. So, you know, the, the reality was that they were right there already with with good talent and then they added they, they added the claw and it, 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 they got great and and marcus Saul was a nice fit because they, yeah. uh, they, they is a winner and well yeah and to speak to that guys like norm powell were second round picks that they turned in the rotation pieces on a championship team exactly so that that helps <laughs> the uh so you uh going back to the basketball league for a second how do you guys i guess recruit talent to the league well, you know, it's 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 part of the success of our growth is there's so much talent in North America. Yeah. So you know, it's not like, like people go, "Are you worried it's going to water down?" Man, there's the easiest part of 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 this piece is finding players and coaches because everybody wants to be in the league because it, we do pay everybody and that's a piece of it. But the bigger issue is we're a showcase league. Yeah. So you get a chance to to show their where uh, coaches. Dancers, announcers, broadcasters. I mean, people are in the G League and the NBA, a lot of those roles because of our league, because they've had a chance to show what they have. The Pacers have two or three girls that came from the Kokomo Bobcats. You know, they're, 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 they're what a great way to cut your teeth to be a pro dancer. And so people are begging to get in our league, and, and we do combines, and about 80% of our guys come through tryouts. Yeah. It's amazing. So, I guess has anyone come from the basketball league and elevated themselves into the G League or the NBA? Well, we have four guys played in the NBA already. I mean, we yeah. have Lindy Waters plays with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Yep. Um, we have Xavier Moon plays for the uh, LA Clippers. Uh, last year, uh, Chance Comanche finished the season with the Portland Trailblazers. The year before that, we had a kid named Craig Sword that yeah. played with Washington Wizards and. I think he'll give a chance. I think all four will be back in the league this year. Craig had a wonderful summer winning the TBT and playing on the G League national team that would play a, a Olympic qualifier. And he and Xavier both played on that team, and they showed themselves. I mean, Xavier is one of the fastest guards in the NBA, and uh, Craig's one of the greatest defenders. And Lindy Waters, when he first got called up to Oklahoma City, was the fastest guy to 20 or 53s that they'd ever had in the franchise. And, you know, and Chance is just a different kind of athlete at six, eleven, seven foot that can run, and you know he's got a spot to get there. So yeah, we've had we've had several. And there's more in, in, that are on their way. I think there's a kid named Eugene German that's from uh, up in Gary that that played at Northern Illinois that uh, has been making a, a good living in China that I think is going to be either in a G League or an NBA team this year. Well, the third two way slot helps get some of those guys a chance too. Yeah, and and and. It, what I've been proud of, specifically Xavier and uh, Lindy, um, they've been two ways a lot. And Lindy, Lindy has gone, like Lindy had 28 against Trey Young in the and the Atlanta Hawks, and they're both from Norman, Oklahoma. So you are you grew up as your arch rivals. The, uh, Lindy went to Oklahoma State, and Trey goes to o OU. Trey blows up, and Lindy's stuck in TBL. And you're going, ah, oh, gosh, that's tough. And he's just such a pro. He goes and he, he kills it against Atlanta. The next day, somebody becomes healthy. They move him back to the G League. And without missing a beat, he has 16, 18, 20, three games in a row because he because he accepts the, 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 the process. He trusts the process, so to speak. And that's what our guys are 
they're fines for the NBA because they're just so happy to be there that if they're in the G League, the NBA, it doesn't matter. They're just happy to be a part of it. And Lindy and Xavier specifically have proven that. So how does uh how do teams, I guess, join the league? Because uh is it are are you approached? Do you like pick a market to try to stick a team or no, it's actually a hundred percent of our teams we've ever brought in have contacted me. I don't contact anybody. Okay. I don't buddy because um you know, Hunter, I'm I'm one of the great salesmen you'll ever meet. I can I'm like have you seen the movie Taken? Yes. With Liam? He has the line that, you know, I have a very unique that I will I will find you and, and I will kill you. Um I I I um I have a very unique skill set. I will find you and I will sell you. And I'm a, I'm a career peddler. And the last thing I want to do is sell somebody on doing something. I want them to come to me because this is what they want to do. This is their dream. They're happy. They want to be a part of it. And and then, you know, in, in our world, we really want people that want to help their community. Our teams in, in Indiana, there's the, the three market owners are very interested in helping bringing something to, to their community. It's not about money, although they can all make money. And that's not why you do this. You do this because you love your community and you see the value that we add. We do a great job. Our team is a community asset, not just because it's it's a great entertaining product. You got to trust me that that's that's the easiest part. But will we do the the volunteer stuff in the schools? Will we will we read the schools? Heck, in Medora, um, our guys are two thirds of their substitute teachers are our players. And they love it because all of a sudden you've got guys that don't look like they're from Medora walking through the hallways teaching these kids, and they're getting the the better and they get their attention because a six nine guy comes and teaches you. You know they're not from around here, but it's pretty cool. So they they we have a chance to really impact lives. It's pretty neat. The so going back because I'm curious, you were so how long were you with Cleveland? I know you're there for one year, but were you just on the bench most of the year? Or? No, I was on the bench all of the year. Uh, as far as my, I, mean, I played so little, my snaps rested shut on the side of my warm ups. I never got bench. I, I I got to play uh, in a um. I got to play in a um in a in, in in some of the exhibition games and was doing pretty good. And then the coach got fired, and, and it was kind of harder. And then towards the end, about halfway through the season, uh, I had a really decent game for me against the Lakers, where I played. I don't know, seven, eight minutes, and I had some points and some rebounds. And they called me up and said they, 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 they called down to the locker room and said for me to come up and see the coach. And so I'm like, oh, that's not good. And I went up to the office, and and he looked at me, and he goes, Mags, we love you. We want to guarantee next year's contract. We think that that you really are a 6'8 guard, which no one's ever seen a 6'8 white guard at that point. That Magic was a guard, but they didn't – you know, that back then there were these racial stereotypes that – White people weren't athletic enough to play certain positions, and black people weren't smart enough to be quarterbacks and and managers yeah. in baseball. But Doug Williams comes in and proves that wrong, and now we have two black quarterbacks last year. And you know, uh, Dusty Baker proves you can be a great uh, manager in baseball. So th- th- those stereotypes get broken, and the Europeans change that. And and, yeah. and for me, that's why a guy like Luca would have been a small forward when I played. There's no way they would have let him yeah. play guard. Um. But they said they, they could see that. And uh, so they want to guarantee my contract to come back another year, which I was just thrilled with. And he said, but because you're not really a small forward, we, we think that um, we need another small forward. Larry Keenan's available. So we'd like you to go on the injury reserve for 10 days and fake an injury. Because back then, there was no reserve clause. It was just an injury reserve with yeah. three guys on the, on, the, on the bench. They're rarely hurt. But for me, it's like, so I've got to fake an injury to, to get a paycheck. All I can say is, what is the profit of man to gain the world and lose the soul? And they said, well, you know, you either do this or you'll never play again. I'm like, well, you do what you got to do. And they were right. I never got another good look in the NBA. And, and, and you know, 100, this is uh, 44 years ago, yeah. 43 years ago that happened. And um, it's the greatest success of my life. I never knew I had the courage to walk away from something I love like that. And at 63 years old, I'm more relevant today than I've ever been. And all that basketball stuff playing, that's great. And, but I don't live in those days. I live today. I get the chance every morning to wake up and talk to young people like you and 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 encourage 800 guys that will be pro athletes this year because of what we're doing. So, you know, I 
I'm, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's eight, it's nine 30 here. Um, but I've been up since I'm in, I'm in Portland, Oregon. I've been up since three o'clock here. Cause I stay on the East coast time all the time. <laughs> and you know, I love it cause I have something to do and I have a reason to live. And so for me, I think the the definition of wealth when you get over 60 is, is are you relevant? And I get to be relevant every day of my life. So I'm real happy with the way things turned out and, you know, uh, would I've loved to, to to see if I could have really made it in the NBA? That would have been great, but it wasn't to be. So I I accepted that a long time ago. The I guess speaking of wrapping up on Cleveland, who's your best teammates in Cleveland? Well, Scotty was my was, was my favorite. We had a guy named Paul Mokeski that I played with yeah. in Kansas, great player. A guy named Steve Hayes was a seven footer, was good. A seven footer named James Edwards was really good. Uh, Lowe's Moore I played with from West Virginia, who was a uh, one of their all-time leading scorers behind Jerry West. Um, we had World B Free. Yeah. Uh, was a trip, but he was a good dude. Sam Lacey was a good dude. Um, um, we had uh, Ron Brewer. This kid, he went to Arkansas. And this kid would go to Arkansas and play in the NBA. Great guy. Bobby Wilkerson uh, from the undefeated uh, the 76 National Championship team at IU. Wonderful guy. Great teammate. Mean, tough, make you better. Really could defend. I mean, we we had juice that could have been good, but the coaches didn't believe in it, so they wanted to. You know, the game was becoming a faster paced game, and they didn't think we had the talent to run, so they tried to slow it down. And all that meant is we lost a lot of close games. You know, it wasn't like we were we were getting blown out a lot. It was just we just didn't have the juice to to, to close it out that way. I know Cleveland had a reputation for being a a weird franchise until really around they got. You know, when they got Brad Doherty was when things really started to change. But they had an owner named Ted Stepien. Yep. And and Ted was um he was an advertising guy like uh like um uh Steinbrenner had some advertising background. Yeah. And he fired to be the, the, the bass, the NBA's version of the of the Yankees, which meant he fired and hired and fired Bill Musselman five times. He just he just did stuff that was goofy and, and he made so many moves one year that the NBA stepped in and said, you can no longer make moves without our permission because you're hurting our brand. And he has, and, a, he has the rule named after him so where you can't trade your first round picks in consecutive years. Exactly. That's how, that's how the Lakers built magic and, and, um, and um, James worthy and those guys, they all came from those picks. Yeah. The, uh, the, I didn't know. Cause I know like, I figured you you overlapped with World Be Free, who's as an individual scorer was just really good. <laughs> the uh... but World didn't love to practice, but he loved to play. So what was fun for me, since I wasn't getting much playing time, he would he would kind of dog it in practice, and then he'd say, "Let's play one on ones," and he'd play his butt off one on ones afterwards. And for me, you know, I I was just basically basically playing defense all the time, practice and. In the middle of an NBA season, you don't practice very hard because they're saving your legs. The world would go at it and practice afterwards. And I love that about him. And even though he was kind of a star, he still treated me with respect. And I I, I always appreciated guys that were above me that was, you know, would, would be respectful towards me. How athletic was he? Very he was he was strong, he could jump, he was uh, he brought the ball way behind his head when he shot. So it was really hard to block his shot. Um, but you know, he, he was, he's, he's from a small HBCU division two yeah. school and, and made himself a really good NBA player. The, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess this is my last question. Any CBA stuff that you like the, I guess any, did any teammates in CBA, but went on to be really good or any stuff in the CBA you enjoyed? So, interesting. Uh, I would say a, a couple CBA things was one, I played with Lowe's more in, in in Cleveland and in the CBA and Lowe's became a really dear friend and we were roommates in the CBA and, and it, on Tuesday night or whatever night St. Elsewhere came on, he had to have the rights to the TV and watch St. Elsewhere. But his best friend was a kid from Mount Vernon named, named uh, Denzel Washington. And he said, he's going to blow up. He's going to be a big I'm like, come on. Denzel would, would later not only blow up, he would give Lowe's 10 or 20 million to build a new a new boys and girls club that Denzel donated all the money for because he loved Lowe's. So that was kind of interesting. The great part about about the CBA was that we um 
we Albany loved the Patroons. So they, it was a great place to play. They treated you great. And like when we went to Puerto Rico, they chartered a plane and all the fans filled in all the seats. And it was wild. It was a lot of fun to play in Puerto Rico. Um, I didn't have a great CBA year. I had a good one. And then my wife had our first baby. And when I went home in the delivery room after the baby was born, I got a call from Phil Jackson. And he says, hey, Max, congratulations on the baby. You need to get back here tomorrow. I'm like, why, why do I have to get back? Because I was the baby was born in Kansas City. And I said, why do I have to get back here tomorrow? And he said, because the Knicks just cut Rudy Macklin, and we're going to pick him up to take your place. And if you want to stay in the CBA, you got to become the backup power forward. So I went from the starting small forward to the backup power forward. And you know, I, I didn't accept that very well. I probably was not proud of the way I behaved during that time because I was too immature to accept that. But it was a neat place. We won the, we won the CBA championship, but none of our players got called up. And if you have 12, you know, I think we played with 10 guys. If you have 10 guys and not one guy gets a look in the NBA, that's not what the CBA was for back then because it was the, the G League, D League. So if we weren't getting guys up, winning a championship wasn't as important to us as getting seeing guys get contracts. So I, I went to Europe after that. Yeah, the uh, the the uh, I was gonna say when guys got cut back then, did they end up in a CBA roster pretty quick? If they wanted to keep playing, I mean, yeah. some some were too proud to, others would stay. The scary thing about the CBA is you could, you don't want to be the all time leading scorer in the CBA because that means you didn't get much of a chance out of yeah. it. Yeah, so you want to get in and get out if you can, and and um, yeah, that's that's the difference of what we're doing. Our guys want to get out, but they love just the opportunity because they're typically not coming down to us. They're going up from us. So it's just a different mindset. But a kid pays money to try out. He's grateful with anything you give him. And it's great. I mean, our guys are wonderful. They're really wonderful to be around. So that's all I got. Uh, do you have anything extra? No, I just uh, – please tag me and tag our league and whatever you put in every post. But we'll make it look good and kind of honored that I get to be on after Scott Fields, one of my dear friends. He's a great guy. So this has been Hunter Way at the Athletes Lounge podcast. This has been uh, David Magley. That's uh, that's all I got. Thanks, brother. Hey, guys. This is Hunter Way at the Athletes Lounge podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe where you can. Thanks.